him as well. Um, moving on. Okay, getting into our, our lesson tonight. I pulled this meme off the other day. Some of you have seen the poem about the two steps and, you know, one set of steps disappeared. He yeah, says, you know, where were you? Why weren't you with me in this time of trouble? How many times do you think Christ kind of felt like this? Okay, and if you think about the early days of the church, I feel like, this is me, I feel like that there were, there were times when Christ was, man, come on, you know. Because when he's dealing with the early apostles, the early church, and the struggles that they went through, and he's teaching his disciples, and there's some things it seems like he does repeatedly, over and over again. Wouldn't it be great if there was an instruction manual that he gave us and where he told somebody, hey, this is what you need to do. This is how you need to do it. If you've got your Bibles with us, turn to Matthew chapter 10. We're going to look at the limited commission. Now, we know the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost. Okay, that was... The Great Commission, that's when he sent them out. This is the limited condition, the limited commission. Okay? So the limited commission was specifically, I would say, I would identify this as almost like a soft opening. You know when a when a restaurant has a, a soft opening or or um, harbor freight here locally? Apparently, I, I may have missed it because I didn't see any deals, but they've not had a grand opening yet. There are signs that say grand opening. They didn't have a big event. You know, it's just like one day it was open. You go in there and they were selling stuff. It was the same prices as everywhere else. And I'm like, I missed your grand opening. Oh, they, we're not, we didn't have a grand opening yet. We're having a, this is a soft opening. So what this is, this is a chance for us to do business and make all of our mistakes like I had a, 20% off a coupon or something. Well, it wasn't working. Well, they had to, the internet was down. Something was wrong. You get an opportunity to make your mistakes almost without having to do a grand opening. You don't have people lined up you know, waiting on you to fix your mistakes. And it's kind of you're training your employees and, and doing things. In my mind, the limited commission was almost like I'm going to send these disciples out. I'm going to have them do what... We, they need to be doing while I'm still here to coach them. Um, I saw them waving back here. I thought maybe I'd bumped it off. Okay, we're good. All right. Um, while I'm still here to coach them. Okay, so in Matthew chapter, we're going to look at that, this for just a few minutes. I've probably got more material than I'm going to get through. But starting in chapter 10, verse 1. And when he had called unto them, Unto him, his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. And now the names of the twelve apostles were the first, Simon, who is called Peter, Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew the publican, James the son of Alphaeus, and Labaius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him, these twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not. But rather, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So what do we see right here? Verses 1 through 6. Okay, he names who he is. He said, we've got twelve people right here. And who did he send them out to? Who did he send them out to? The Israels, the Israelites. Okay, those in Jerusalem. Okay, he didn't send them to Rome. He didn't send them somewhere where they were going to be, you know, there wasn't any preparation there. He sent them right there to, to those of Israel, to the Jews. What did he do first? What did he do before he sent them out? Give them instructions, and he gave them the ability to do what? To, to power, the ability to perform miracles. He gave them that ability. Okay? 
So he gave them what they needed first. He made sure they were equipped, and then he sent them out. It was in preparation for the Great Commission. We're going to look at, we're going to try to get through seven different lessons from chapter 10 here, if, it, if we have time to. So this chapter would just about teach us how to evangelize the same way that it did them, because Christ gave them specific instructions. Okay, the first thing we will look at, how were they sent? They were sent two by two. Okay, the only time I really recollect hearing about somebody being by themselves is in Acts chapter 8 when Philip goes and talks to the eunuch. Okay, that's, that's the only thing that I was really thinking about that really came to mind, my mind. They were sent out two by two. In Luke chapter 10 verses 1, Christ, I think it was, it was either 70, I put 72, but it may have been 70, um, 72 people that he had. We can look that up real quick. Luke chapter 10 verse 1. Somebody can grab that for me. Luke chapter 10, verse 1. I might be able to grab it. Was it 70? I might have. I, I think the, the word there is called fat fingering when you're typing something and you hit the wrong button. But, but he sent them, that being said, Christ sent them out 70, 70 pairs, 70 people, and he sent them out in pairs. He didn't send them out alone. You look through, there was, there was Paul and Barnabas, and then, then Barnabas... Um, and, and John Mark, and then Paul went with Silas. Uh, there were always, it seemed like, a group. There was more than one person. Well, why were they sending them out in pairs? Why were they doing it in the works of two? Quite simply, most of the time, the, sum, or the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Two people working together get more done than one person walking or doing it themselves. If I were tasked with moving this table right here by myself, step one would be to find somebody to help me, to be honest, because I couldn't do it myself. Or, or get a furniture mover or something like that. If we get two people, we can do it. If we get three or four, we can do it a whole lot faster. We can do it a whole lot more efficient. There's several times that we've had to move our heavy furniture up here and, you know, I'm sitting over here and thinking, I've, I've got to get up there and help them. Well, by the time we take care of the girls and get out, there's already so many people on it, and it's, it's gone, you know, because we have a lot of help. There's a lot of, of, of ability to do that. We become more efficient when we add more labor. Another thing, if two people are working together, especially if they're not... You know, very seldom do you want to put two people together that think exactly the same way because they grow off each other. They teach each other things. Um, there's, there's different schools of thought with different, with different people. So something that I may miss, a comment that I could make, a, a question that I could ask, if I missed it, there's somebody else there to pick you up and to help you. You teach each other. Another thing... John 8, 17 tells us it teaches credibility. It talks about having two witnesses at that time or in that verse. So if you have two people that are saying something, it, it increases your credibility. Along those lines, I would caution you, visiting, the days that we're living in, you probably need to have somebody with you. It's just the way things are anymore. Having somebody with you protects you. We have... Uh, unfortunately, there's different challenges that, that we encounter today that, that we've not necessarily encountered in the past. Okay, our next slide. Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 and 6. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans. I'm sorry, did I... Five and six. I'm rereading. Re go into any city of the Samaritans, ye enter not, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. One thing it, this tells us about, when you got talking about go to the house of the Israel, go to the Jews. They're specializing. Okay? Specific instructions. They were to go to the people who were familiar, familiar with them. Okay? How is that applicable, applicable to us? How do, we, 
how, what do we take away from that? Quite simply, let's do everything in our power to put ourselves in a position to win. Okay? That's why we're sending out the cards, the concern cards, and the new movers. Let's try to find the low-hanging fruit. Christ was sending, in theory, the Jews should have been more receptive to Christ, to the gospel, than the Gentiles. The risk was lower, in theory. Until Paul came along. To the Gentiles. To the Gentiles. That's right. And that's one of the things we talked about. You know, even, even on down the road, we see Peter was talking with the Jews. He was teaching the Jews. Paul was teaching with the Gentiles. Let's put ourselves in a position to win. Let's do the things that where we're going to have our highest level of success. Um, in the sales world, and that's really what we're doing to some degree, we have what's called warm leads. A warm lead is someone that already knows about your product or thinks that your product has value. Okay. Very seldom will I try to sell something to somebody that knows absolutely nothing at all about what I do, nor do they have need for my product. I might try to talk to them and fill out if they have a need for that product, but very seldom to do that. You try to go into it knowing a little bit about the person that you're talking to. And once again, we're in a situation, that first cold call, that first sales call, that first time we visit somebody, you may ask them for a Bible study. That's not really necessarily the goal. We're here to build relationships. We're here to get to that next step. We're here to get to that, get that first down, like we keep on talking about. Yes, sir. Everyone has the need. That's correct. That's right. There's there's the joy. And and along those lines, we are told to spread the seed. Okay? Dan, Rick, y'all been doing a lot of visiting here lately. Even if you necess don't necessarily have an overwhelmingly positive contact that necessarily that, that week, how do you feel after you've gotten out and done the visits? You still feel good. Um, a few weeks ago, we went and, and cleaned up a lady's yard. Okay, It was in December. It was, it was late in the year, whenever it was. A lot of leaves hadn't, I mean, but we had seven or eight guys and some equipment, and we got it done pretty quick. And she was so thankful she wasn't home when we did it, okay? We just called and left her a message, hey, my name's Brandon Savage from Crossville Church of Christ, and we're coming to clean up your yard. And she got her message and then got home. It was already dark. One of her neighbors called her to tell her how, how good her yard looked. She hadn't even seen it yet. And uh, was so glad that she got her yard cleaned up. Well, she was really thankful for that. And she said, you know, and that was right after we'd been sending a lot of cards. She made the comment. She's like, we've been hearing a lot over here in the Glade about how, how, uh, how involved the church is and how, uh, how they're doing things in the community and whatnot. That made me feel really good about what we were doing. Rick made a comment. He said, my church doesn't visit 
anymore. People don't visit anymore. There's a lot of factors going into that, but we don't visit like we used to. Dan? Rick fixed a flat tire, pulled up somebody's house to do a visit and Okay. So so there's needs out there that we can help people with. Um, it's but but we have to go and visit with them. We have to talk to them to ever, to ever figure that out, to know what their needs are. Okay? Verse 7. And go and as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Christ gave people, or gave the disciples, a specific message. Remember, the, ki- the kingdom had not yet come. Okay? Their goal was to go and preach a specific message, to stay with the word. Now, after the Great Commission, we still see them doing that. The example would be Philip and the eunuch. He goes to the eunuch and he preaches Christ. He hears him reading the book of Isaiah. The man doesn't know what he's hearing and he goes and he preaches Christ to him. And the next thing you read, he's saying, here is water. What hindereth me from being baptized? Okay, so he preached the word. Paul taught in the synagogues and he taught from house to house. He gave them, they had a specific message that they were going and teaching. Timothy, Paul told Timothy, he gave him a specific message. You know, in, in chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. This Sunday, in our Sunday morning worship hour, we're going to start the Back to the Bible series and going through that. The goal is for everyone here to be educated enough to at least assist with a Bible study. If you're not assisting with the Bible study, at least you know what the material is. It's good information to know whether we're teaching someone or not. But it's a united message. It's 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 we're preaching what the word is. We're teaching what the word is. Let's see here. First fourth point in verse eight. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received. Freely give. Imagine that you were in the shoes of of the Jews in that time. And all of a sudden, you may have known about the prophecies. You may have known about the law and known your history. And then all of a sudden, somebody comes in and they start teaching something different. But it's not really different. What they're teaching is that everything that you have known and that you have learned is now coming to fruition. The times that you've been warned about, the prophecies of a Christ coming, He is now here. Okay? You might think about that and say, okay, it could be. It could be that. That could be the case. But that might not have been the first time they've heard that. But when somebody starts raising people from the dead, when they start healing the blind, causing the blind to see and the lame to walk, do you not think that those disciples would have had more credibility? That it wouldn't have caused some people to go give some pause and say, now wait a minute here, we have never seen anything like this before. Now I feel like that's one of the reasons that they had that ability is so that it would give them credibility. And if you look here, they were, they were instructed to, <clears throat> that they were the, to use those gifts freely. Okay? What good would have having those gifts been if they never used them? They might as well have not had them if they weren't using them. So what it tells us when we think about it, how is, every time you look at something like this, I want to think about how is that verse applicable to us How is that something that we will use today? Okay. Does our benevolence give us credibility? We can't heal the sick. We can't raise the dead. But we can do things through benevolence and through the giving of our time 
that increases our credibility, that causes us to be more credible. So, so the parallel there, they were, they, were, they were instructed to raise or to heal those who were physically sick, those who were physically dead. Our, our and I'm just repeating just for the, thing, for, for the, so everybody would hear them, but the parallel is that we have the ability to heal those who are spiritually sick, to teach them, those who are lost. So, so we're going to weigh that against another point here in just a minute. Clyde. <laughs> so, what what? I would argue that if you're evangelizing, if you're teaching people, that it helps you as much as it helps them. That it motivates you to study your Bible. Yeah, yeah. So that's and and we'll talk about that as well. There's another piece piece of that if we get to if we have to, time to get to it. Okay, verse or the fifth point, Matthew chapter nine and, or chapter ten, nine and ten. I've written that down wrong. Verses nine and ten. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses nor script for your journey. Neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. Imagine being sent into the world to do work. Don't take any money with you. I've got a rule anymore. If I'm going to be more than a tank of gas away from the house... I need to carry at least $200 with me because my theory is if I have $200 and the keys to a vehicle, I can drive home. But these people, they were told to leave and don't take any money with you. It'll be provided. Don't take any gold. Don't take any scripts. Now, part of this could be that they're saying, hey, don't take any money from, for, for what you're doing. And you think about Simon the sorcerer. He was like, I want that ability to do these gifts. He saw this right here. He said, hey, I can, I can use this to my advantage. 
Now, it could be what they were saying too. But this also teaches us that it's okay to support those who are doing that work, whether it be our missionaries, somebody that's, you know, in a foreign field or someone here locally. If you were to do something for somebody, whether you're buying a meal or whether you're, um, you know, helping somebody with yard work or doing something like that, we would appreciate it if you would, if we have budgeted some items to, uh, to, to compensate for that, we would appreciate it if you would give us the receipt and let us reimburse you. If you don't, that's fine, but let us know about it. Larry. Sometimes we treat the symptom and not the part and not the problem. Correct. So, you know, the thing is, one of the reasons that, you know, we're here is to help fill those needs. Okay, one of the needs for the church, I would argue our our primary need is to grow. We're here to spread the gospel. It costs money, okay? The church has that available. The church, we, but but realistically, and we're not going to get as far as I wanted to, Our limiting factor on how much we grow and how much we want to do is not financial. That is, what resource do we have the least amount of in reality? It is time and it is labor. You know, the harvest is right, but the laborers are few. What we have to focus on, our greatest limiting factor, is our labor and our time. But I think that we can... uh, we're heading in the right direction. We're building a lot of momentum right now. We've got some more steps. I appreciate your attention tonight. And if you have any questions, I'll be, I'll be around. Thank you for everything.